Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the New Way Summer Workshop to 2021, Thinking Like a UX Designer. Uh, thank you so much for choosing to be here with me uh, because I know there's plenty of a workshop that looked incredible. Uh, so thanks for being here. And uh, yeah, we're gonna have a nice uh, hour and a half together. So yeah, let's get started. So before I introduce myself, uh, I would love to hear from you. Um, and for that, I'm also going to introduce Myro, uh, which is going to be our tool uh, for today. Um, Gavin, can you share the link for everyone to have, please? Yes. So if you click on this link, you'll be able to access the, the Myro board. Um, I'm going to switch to that on my screen. I'm going to let you guys arrive there. Yay, so many of you. Look at that. So shiny and colory. Awesome. So for the My Robot, uh, what we're going to be using the most uh, is the post-it. I don't know if you guys can see me. This is a post-it. Hello, this is Clara. I'm going to try and put it up. It's on the left side of your of the warm up activity. Um, what else? We're going to be using shapes. Um, so we have all types of shape available. Uh, actually, I'll share with you this. Uh, if you click on the shape, you'll be able to select multiple kinds. Um, if also the little arrows disturb you, there's an option here to turn it off. Um, what else? And then, yeah, we have the emojis as well. So they are in the three double dots on the toolbar on the on the left. So here and you're, you're going to be able to choose like a range of emoji. I don't know. Let's choose something nice. Yes, a big smiling face. There you go. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, so with that, if you have questions about it, by the way, uh, just ask in, in the chat. Oh, yeah, and, and we'll make sure you guys get it. Um, so with this, I want to hear about you. Um, oh my God. So you can see on the first, uh, on the first uh, warm up activity uh, thing on the first frame, uh, there's a map um, and there's a place for you to put post-its. Um, so my question for you is, where are you right now? Can you answer with a, an emote? Uh, to tell me where you are in the world uh, and what's your favorite game and why. Uh, I'm hoping if you're here, it's because you have a favorite game. So yeah, let me know. I'll give you like a couple of minutes. So I see there's some people. From Arabia, Australia. I'm purchasing my geography today. That's really cool. India. Nice. Wow, we got people from everywhere. The US. Awesome. I see a big Red Dead Redemption <laughs> post-it. <laughs> Can you tell me why you like it? On your post-it? That'd be interesting to know. Oh, Persona. I love the UI in Persona. Undertale. Oh, yes, that's a good one. I made John Baby, no, it's a serious one too. Serious contender. <laughs> it's a good game. <laughs> Skate City. I don't know about it. Ooh. Okay. Well, you got a bit of everything. That's really nice. Roblox, yeah. 
Again, chilling in back, crab head, Minecraft. Nice. Wow, there's a bit of everyone. That's pretty cool. I like seeing that you guys love all different kinds of games. This is really nice. Awesome. Well, my favorite game is uh, The Last of Us 2, I think. Um, I just love the story and I just love killing zombies in general. Um, so this is a, a game I just really love. Um, okay, I'll let you guys finish. Uh, I'm just going to introduce myself uh, as well. Um, so I'm Claire. Uh, I'm going to go back to the screen, sorry. So I'm Clara, uh, I'm 28, uh, I work in the video game industry. I'm from France, so you can hear that with my accent, I think. Um, so what I always loved when I was a kid uh, was telling story, um, a lot of stories, different type. Uh, I used to draw comics, um, so I went pretty naturally uh, into animation. I did a two years animation in Paris. Uh, then I started going into cinema, uh, same thing. I just like the teamwork, uh, you know, working with softwares and the fact that we all had to be communicative and working together. Um, so I studied after that at Norwich at New Way uh, with Gavin. Gavin was with me that year uh, for one year. And then I went to Montreal, Canada, where I am now, uh, and I started working in post-production. Uh, so I was doing mostly editing and then I got a chance, completely random, um, to work at Compulsion uh, Games as a videographer, which is where I work now. Uh, then I assumed the role of uh, UI designer and more recently UI designer. Um, and so that's that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I kind of want to hear for you, from you, uh, you know, what do you think UX designer do? Uh, what do you think UX means? Like, I kind of want to know what you think. Uh, if you have, maybe you have some ideas, maybe you don't, uh, it's fine. Uh, so you can write the first thing that comes to mind, like write it down in sentence and two, uh, what do you think it means? Well, the task uh, in the my robot as well. I'll, I'll, I'll give you maybe, uh, maybe like three minutes for this. So you can see it on the task one, what is UX design frame? Uh, you should be able to write down your answer here, your answers here. Oh. Teaching the user the purpose of something and how to use it without being too intrusive. That's really good. That's really good. UX designer people design website and apps to make them convenient for users. That's nice. UX equal user experience. Design the theme and interface of a PP of apps. How the user interacts with the program. It's really nice. You guys have a very good idea. You did research beforehand. I have nothing to teach you. <laughs> UX design focuses on the experience a user has interacting with a product or service. I've heard it mostly about software. Making the process of navigating a platform a smooth experience for the user. They mostly work on apps and website. That's really cool. The player experiences the game or website. That's nice too. Okay. 
makes the design really understandable for every type of people. That's also a great one. We're going to tackle that actually. Design and user interaction. You guys are really good. All right, we're good. <laughs> I love your background on Zoom. Yes, this is Totoro. It's the best. Ease of access for users. Oh, I see you guys. Um, yeah, I think we got a couple of keywords in there, but you really got nailed. That's really good. Okay, I'm not going to let oh, carry out of time. Um, that's really good answers. Um, I'm really impressed. Um, so let's talk about you know uh, what what it is. But you guys really nailed it. Um, so UX is indeed a user experience. Uh, it means uh, the overall experience of the player slash customer using our product slash game. So as you guys mentioned, it could be an app, it could be a website, it can be anything. It can even be a car, a car interface, for example. Uh, we can also be a game. And since I work in video games, we're mostly going to focus on uh, what we do in video games. Um, so yeah, when I talk about experience, I talk really about like the interaction with the controllers, with the interfaces, with the features in the game. Um, and my job is really to make that interaction fun, uh, intuitive, and easy. Uh, I work with game designers, uh, level teams, and, and artists to help them, you know, realize their features the best way possible, uh, and convey the right signs and feedback. Uh, so making sure player can understand what's happening in the game. So all in all, you know, uh, UX is very much the art of problem solving. Uh, we mostly test things, uh, fix issues that you know might be uh, might be not understood by player. Um, we're on the side of the user because sometimes uh, designers forget uh, who they're designing for, and it's good to remember, you know, for them to be reminded. Um, as game developers, we don't do the game for ourselves. We do the game for other people. So we need to, you know, keep that in mind when we do it. And UX designers are also here for this. Um, so by the way, I'm using a lot of jargon. Uh, we are sometimes realizing it because, you know, it's my everyday job. Um, so let me know. Uh, when you need me to precise something in the chat, uh, I'll be happy to like define those words for you. So, okay, so to better understand what I mean by experience uh, and UX in general, I'll give you an example of a bad UX experience. So this is like the main offender when we talk about bad UX. Um, so if you don't know what to do next, uh, if you don't understand what is expected of you, uh, something is annoying you when you use it, that's bad UX. So as you can see on those pictures, um, like I have no idea, like the second picture, I have no idea which button I'm supposed to press to get to, uh, to go up or to go down. Like it's not clear, this number on the last one are just completely messed up. Um, yeah, that's like, I don't know how to use it. It's not intuitive to me. So it's, by definition, it's, it's bad UX. Um, and I'm going to show you what it looks like uh, in a video game, because that might be more obvious. Um, so I'm going to show you a video, uh, pay extra att attention to the sound. And uh, tell me in the chat what you think is the problem about this. Beginning mission. Homing torpedoes. Okay, so what do you guys think about this? Let me know in the chat. Uh, what what do you think? Okay, too much going on, sensory overload, very repetitive, yes. The dialogue of the torpedo, not necessary at all, exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's very loud. <laughs> Sorry, that's on my side, I guess, <laughs> when I recorded the video. But yes, yes, him screaming, you're a torpedo, when he launches his, you know, 
a special weapon is uh, definitely not something you want to hear every time. Uh, and it should be clear visually in the first place and with the sound effects. So this is like by definition pretty pretty bad UX. Um, okay, so then what what does good UX look like? You know, um, I give you a couple of examples. This is not super easy because uh, good UX is basically invisible to players. Um, so sometimes it's hard to determine whether something is actually good. Uh, usually if you don't have any issues, it's probably because it's good. Um, so yeah, good UX is, is uh, you know, something, uh, is that a menu, a menu that you can, you can find in like two mouse clicks uh, that will tell you exactly what you want to know. Uh, it's a tutorial that was clear enough so you don't need to review the controls. Uh, it's just, you know, having the time of your life uh, smashing cars in Rocket League because that's damn funny. Um, so all in all, you know, good US is when the game make you feel something. Uh, I wrote down one of my favorite quotes uh, from Celia Odent. Uh, Celia Odent is a game UX consultant. She worked uh, for Fortnite. She was the lead UX designer on the Fortnite series at the very beginning. Uh, and she kind of like instilled UX in game uh, at the time, it was like 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and she, she said, uh, people learn and remember better what is meaningful to them and emotional. And UX is definitely about this, is making people attached to a video game because the experience is so smooth that they can experience, you know, they can feel the emotions that the dev wanted to communicate with them. So UX, technically speaking, uh, it has a lot of field associated with it, uh, and we're not going to review all of them. Uh, so today we'll be, we'll be focusing on the following, uh, wireframe, uh, playtest, accessibility, and user flow. Uh, this is the most, you know, this is one big part of my job. So it's something I feel comfortable explaining guys to you. Uh, yeah, and you see, it's going to be really funny. Sorry. So all of this is really part of the user interface. And I want to give you a warning about this. Uh, UX is not UI, so user interface, and UI is not UX. Um, you always find those job offers. Uh, they kind of say like, I'm looking for UX slash UI designer or UI designer. And then when they show you the, when you see the task, when you read them, you're like, oh, that's that's basically UX designer's job. And those things are very different because uh, we do very different things. Uh, UI is the art. So how it will look like uh, the color, the composition, uh, the typography. And UX is the blueprint behind it. So really, it's how does it work? Um, how does it function? What do, do people do to use it? Um, and that, that is what we are looking out today. So this is an example of interface. Um, you know, they can be of any type. Uh, so this one is like the inventory from Destiny 2. Uh, it can be also the map from Fortnite. Um, and you know, as a UX designer, I'm really in charge of designing this interface. Again, not the art, making sure you know, they're coherent, uh, they work together uh, before a UI designer comes in and makes it pretty. Uh, that's also one of uh, actually my design. Uh, when we worked on We Happy Few, uh, made it with one of my wonderful colleagues, Sarah Hamilton. Uh, yeah. So how does it work when I'm going to design, you know, an interface for, for a video game? Um, usually I get a brief uh, from a game designer. Or I'll, get, I'll make the brief myself. Uh, for example, let's say the, the main menu of a game. Um, and, you know, each screen we do in a game as a goal. Like we don't do screen for pressures, even though a lot of UI designers would love that. Um, but, you know, all, each screen I have a goal. So, for example, an inventory will ask you to display what your character has so you can make choices in the game, like crafting, things like this. The bestiary can give you information about the law of the game, like in which you're free. Um, and, you know, once I got the brief nailed out, um, move on to what we call wireframes and user flow, uh, which is what I'm going to explain to you next. So wireframes, uh, I don't know if you guys ever heard of those, um, but they are low level representation of a screen. Um, so we usually use very simple shapes to show where things will be. Uh, 
um, the goal of this is to be iterating quickly because uh, we need to test sometimes very, very quickly and modify even more quickly. Um, so it's a great way for us to move things around without having the UI artist to redo all the art and then present it again. And it's also a tool of communication. It's something we use a lot uh, to communicate with production, with programming, with art, uh, to make sure everyone's on the same page. So this is an example of a wireframe. This is an example from Wasteland 3. Uh, as you can see, it's very complete. It's very full. Uh, the next one is even more full. It's a very, I wouldn't call that a wireframe at that point. Maybe it would be a mockup. And this is also a very acceptable version of a wireframe. It can be anything uh, you feel is, is, you know, you feel is acceptable for it. Um, there's no like template or anything. We don't use, we don't use any template. Um, and the goal, so the goal of wireframes in general are to, to you know help create an intuitive interface so uh, we mean wireframes we can understand better how a screen work uh, make you know work on this so iterating and making sure it makes sense uh, we can also you know evaluate the existing wireframes so when we have a, a lot of different screens they're going to be all together in one menu we can see you know if we have repeating repeating like composition for example so like let's say text information is always going to be on the right side of the screen things like that and like i said it's a great presentation tool so yeah let's start by building our own wireframe um so i'm going to give you a short brief uh so we need to do a mode selection screen uh, for Fortnite. Um, so you're going to need to draw out a wireframe that contains the following. Uh, three game mode buttons to be selected. Uh, so save the world, battle royale, and creative. And a short description for each of these modes. Uh, you're not going to need to write any. You can put a Laurie Mimpson, or you can just put a line saying the text is going to be here. Uh, and controls for the screen. So A to select and B to cancel. Um, so I'm just going to show you uh, a couple of mode selection screens so you know what I mean. Um, so for example, the second one, uh, top right, you see they're using uh, rectangles to kind of give you uh, different modes. So to this crisis, I'm guessing this probably me main campaign, target practice, uh, sandbox mode, and time trial which is not unlocked here, uh, probably a different phrase type of thing. Um, same for like uh, bottom left, you know, trials, arcade, practice, tutorial, all of these are game modes. Okay, so I'm gonna let you guys maybe work on this for like six, seven minutes, let's say, and I'm gonna do one at the same time as well. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing my screen for that. Just going to quickly say, because I think there's been a few people that have joined in uh, since we started. So for those who have joined in and may have missed the beginning, we're working in Miro today. I'm just going to pop the link to Miro now, which is essentially a free kind of board that everybody can interact with and participate with a workshop today. So I've just dropped the link into the chat and uh, hopefully that should bring you to the Miro board that we're all working with today. Um, and just a note for those who are currently using Miro, it's brilliant to see so many people use it, but you can uh, you can zoom out using uh, the scroll on your mouse or there's um, there's the uh, zoom options in the bottom right corner, I believe. So use use as you know use the rest of the board. It's quite large when you actually zoom all the way out. So use the space if you need to if you need more room. Yeah, if I, go, I can also ask you to keep the board, the board clean so we can see things, you know, and, and refer to them later. I love your drawings, guys. Uh, let's find a space for you to do it, <laughs> but not on the boards I've created. <laughs> so I'll make you one on the side if you want to continue your drawings there. Uh, for the wireframe, you can choose any space on the board you like. Uh, just make sure you can find it afterwards. Okay, so my case, I'm just going to do, let's say that's my screen. Oh, maybe it's better. Just... Uh, 
Okay, free button mode. Hmm. I feel like I might start with something like this. Making those like big and prominent so we can see them nicely. Big enough so I can put descriptions in them. Yeah, so about what you're saying, what's cool is that you can try things. So you can move them around uh, for a long time, actually. <laughs> but uh, what's really fun is trying things, you know, um, like getting inspiration from other games is excellent. Like, that's what we do. There's no, let's not lie about it. Like, we get inspired by a lot of games. Um, but, you know, if you want to try a, a new composition, something that hasn't been done before. It's also really cool. And then we can adjust it, you know, making sure it works uh, maybe in the context of it. So it's really a moment where we can roam free uh, before a programmer tell us no, so. Let me know if you guys have questions uh, in the chat, if you need. Um, you can put colors in your wireframe, but we usually like to keep them uh, black and white, not influence people. Because, you know, colors can give you a direction um, as to like what it's going to feel like. And at that moment, we're more trying to find out what it's going to, you know, how it's going to work. Um, so we usually keep it color free. Uh, this one selected. I will also do like usually a couple of the same wireframe when you click on button. So for example, they'll show you what it looks like when let's say you have a panel open on the left when you like pop up the a text for a description of something. So we usually do like separate a uh, wireframe to show how all the situation would look like and how they kind of like link together. So it's a good way. It's a, like a nice, nice thing also for us to like find out and do. Okay, there's one minute left. I don't know if it's going to be enough for everyone to finish. I'm going to see where you guys are at. Oh, I like those circle, circle ideas. They're really cool. We do think very square in the beginning of industry because it's simpler tech wise to do it. And a lot of us worked in you know the web before. Uh, when we work, you know, with frames and and flex box and stuff like this. So some really cool stuff there. Oh, 
شو هو الاتصال زيبرا جوينج I'll leave you guys one minute to finish. Looks really cool. There's all type of ways you guys found out. It's nice. I like it. Triangle shape. Ooh. Visage. Nice. That's awesome. Well, I'll keep going. I'll let you guys finish at the, at, in the meantime. Um, so I, what I saw was great, actually. Uh, you know, like it's, uh, yeah, again, it's, it's something that's very free. Uh, it's something that, you know, uh, you work out what you need. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to look more. You work out what you need, how you're doing it, and it kind of like informs you what you, uh, what your frame should look like. Um, so that's why there's no templates because every game is different, and sometimes we need to show different stuff, uh, different things that we didn't find, for example, in the game that we did before. Um, so yeah, wireframes are really good for that. Uh, usually, uh, when I'm done with all the wireframes, so everything has been handed out and things and validated by different people, um, I'll work out on the user flow. Uh, so the user flow is another big tool we use in UX. Um, the user flow is really a path uh, that you're going to draw out, uh, taken by, you know, proto typical user uh, on a website or a game uh, to complete the task. So it's something also used in web design. Uh, it's very very effective. Um, so the the user flow really lays out the user's movement through the main menu. Uh, it really map out each and every step the user takes uh, from entry points through the final interaction. Uh, and you know, user can use many different pathways uh, when they're interacting with a game. So the user flow is really a, a visual representation of the many avenues that that, that can be taken when using an app or a website or a game. Um, so the, the flowcharts really begin with the consumer entry point, like I said, like, like for example, an onboarding screen or a home page, a uh, splash screen. Uh, and it ends with the final action or outcome, like purchasing a product or signing up for an account. Um, and depicting this process really allows the designer to evaluate and optimize the user experience. We don't want people to get lost in like, all the screens of the of the game, we want them to go from point A to point B uh, in a, like an efficient and quick manner. So that's an example uh, of a, of a, a user a user flow. So uh, each touch point, so those are like the needle nodes here. Um, they characterized by shape. We usually use a shape to tell what's their um, What's their goal? Uh, and each shape indicates a particular process. Um, so for instance, a diamond means a decision is being made. Uh, so it's therefore followed by yes or no arrows. Uh, a rectangle indicates a task or an action uh, that needs to be taken, uh, like logging or purchase. And a circle would be the action uh, made by the by the user or the player. So here, for example, you see like first we enter. So this is the entry screen. Uh, we display welcome. So that would be the display of the splash screen, for example. Um, 
then we we ask in the same screen to people to select a task. Um, so let's say they select uh, task one. Uh, we check if task one is correct, is accessible, for example, or there's no need to add something before. Uh, if this is correct, we move on to details. If it's not correct, we're going back to selecting the task. Uh, once we're on detail, uh, uh, we can prompt the action that you, you can find something. So you can click on you know that little uh, loop thing that tells you, okay, search for a product on this website, for example. Um, and then from here, you can search item. So if we find an item, great, the goal is complete. Uh, then you can order a close. Uh, if we still we've searched an item and it's not here, um, then we'll display something like no item found. Uh, and I'll probably go back to search items after that. Um, so this is one of the the user flow I did for for our main menu. Uh, this is very very high level. There's not that many details to it. Uh, but this is what I was talking about just before. This one doesn't have any action or uh decisions uh but you know you enter the splash screen we're gonna load the player data uh if you're a first time user uh will give you the basic settings so things like setting up their subtitles the contrast uh things like that if you're a returning user will keep will prompt you directly to the main menu uh and from here you can do a, a range of different tasks so yeah, let's let's do one. Let's do a simplify user flow. I know it can be a bit complicated to comprehend the first uh, the first time. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna start basic. Um, sorry. So I, I gave you a couple of screenshots on the oof, on the on my row. They're on the task free user flow frame. Um, and using the screenshots, uh, I would like you to order them to show the journey the player must go through to achieve this task. So starting a game of Battle Royale in Trio with any quest selected. Uh, so really try to see uh, from the player's eyes, uh, really try to understand what would be the easier way for people to go through. Uh, they gave me many answers to that. Like, obviously, I'm going to show you the one Fortnite choose, but there's many ways for for developers to bring uh, players to do a certain task. But I want to know what you think. So yeah, go on my row. Uh, you can use a post-it. You can write uh, the set the the order you think. Sorry again. The order you think the sequence going to go, and I'll give you maybe a couple of minutes for that. Just to clarify, Clara, do you want everybody to just write the, the numbers, the order sequence, and just put the numbers down? So, for example, yeah. just one to, to four, then to, to two. To yes, to exactly. So it can be. Order. Yes, exactly. So if you think, for example, uh, number three is the first um, the first screen uh, player are going to encounter, you can write three and the next one four. Uh, two, one, for example, um, they can also be uh, repeated screens. Um, so for example, number one can come back or things like that. Whatever you think is the, the other players should go through to complete this task.
So remember what the task is. Uh, the user has to be uh, has to start a game of battle royale uh, with trio uh, and any quest selected, and then we want to launch the game basically. See a lot of very interesting answers. It's cool. What for? Thirty seconds. All right, a lot of different answers. That's very interesting. Um, before I talk about it, let's maybe maybe uh, watch on Fortnite, like see a video of Fortnite. Actually, what the which order they used for? Okay, so that would be number one. Load the screen. And number three. Number two. Then you have to select your quest at number four. And you can, you know, play it. Um, I see some of your ideas are actually very interesting. There's one I found really interesting. Uh, three, one, two, four. So we're sending you first to the lobby, uh, and then we'll ask you to select your battle royale, like which mode you want to play in, uh, with how many people, um, and then the quest, and I'm guessing then back to free, and then launching the game. I really like that. Um, it's actually a really good idea. Um, there's a lot of back and forth in Fortnite that probably is like the way they found the most efficient. Uh, but there, there will be you know, many ways to design this actually. So you guys did a really good job. There's a lot of very interesting propositions in there. Um, oops, sorry. Okay, so, you know, it's great. We've done our, our wireframe, our user flow. Um, we're happy with them. And then, you know, we get it play tested and then it comes back to us and there's a lot of uh, comments about, uh, you know, maybe it's not super accessible. Like the text is too small. People have trouble uh, clicking on the buttons, can be many things. Uh, and so we have to, you know, uh, work on it again. So one of the big other uh, topic uh, that we tackle in UX design is accessibility. Um, so a question for, for you guys, you can answer in the chat. Uh, who here is using subtitles while they play? Uh, 
Alors, chasser me. Ah, for Lego games. Sometimes, not me, always. Yeah, a lot of people, right? Uh, I do too. I mean, I'm not, as you can hear, <laughs> not an English speaker. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, accents are hard for me to understand, especially when they're Scottish. Um, so yeah, I like, I like using subtitles as well. It's also a very nice way to just, you know, rest my eyes a little bit. Um, and, you know, so did like 95% of people who played Assassin's Creed Origins. Uh, Ubisoft did that test. Um, for for on on origins where they let the subtitles on uh by default and turns out only five percent of people um you know turn them off so 95 percent played with it um and you know this is a subject that's really close to my heart uh, i'm representing compulsion uh, at the Xbox Accessibility Champion program. Um, so we meet every month and we discuss and share uh, tips about accessibility and how to make our games more accessible. Um, and you know, it's something then we go back and apply to our companies and try to advocate for the most accessible games possible on Xbox. Um, and when we think of accessibility, you know, most of the time people uh, think about, you know, wheelchair ramps or closed captioning on TV, uh, but it's so much more than that. Um, so uh, let's define accessibility in the first place for video games, you know. Um, adding accessibility means making a title uh, usable to someone with, with one or more disabilities. Uh, it means, you know, breaking the barrier of entry, really. Um, and uh, the, the typically tend to serve one of five types of disabilities. So you have vision, um, anyone who's blind, uh, enabled to distinguish colors or colorblind people, uh, bird vision and so on. You got, uh, you know, anything that's uh, hearing disability, like hard of hearing, uh, deafness, uh, speech, speech impairments, language differences. So we talked about, you know, not being an English native. Uh, mobility, so anything concerning wrist, arms, legs, and impairment, cognitive, uh, learning impairment, resulting challenges, including dyslexia. So it's really a large uh, range, and uh, it's also you know a spectrum in the sense that it doesn't have to be a, a permanent disability for you to be needed um, an accessibility option. For example, you broke your arm and suddenly you have to use on your controller with only one hand and you have options to help you do that. Or, you know, you live in a, in a house where uh, there's a baby, maybe a little siblings uh, sleeping at the moment and you have to keep the sound down. So you're putting on the subtitles, for example. So why is it important? Like, why are we talking about this? And we were not talking about this 10 years ago. Uh, well, games are entertainment. Uh, they are culture, they mean socializing, um, and you know, they also mean the difference between existing and living. Um, for profound impairments, it goes even further. Uh, it can mean therapy, pain relief, escapism, and independence. Um, and the demand for accessibility will definitely grow as the gaming population ages. So. Uh, people who started doing games in the 80s uh, are going to retire soon, and those people won't stop playing games. Uh, and they're going to need adjustment to those games. So the best example that there is out there is really The Last of Us 2. Um, they went you know, far and beyond to uh, carry to the most possible, you know, largest pool of player. Uh, they work with full accessibility um, advisors. Uh, to make out like a, a really big list of accessibility presets and features people could use. Um, and, and, you know, it, it goes to the, to the point that even a blind player uh, can finish uh, The Last of Us 2, actually. Um, and I'm going to show you, uh, you know, a video of what it means to one of these players. Uh, his name is Steve. Uh, he's a 
accessibility advocate for a very long time now. He's very famous in the industry uh, and, and he's been helping Last of Us with their feature. And uh, this is this reaction where when The Last of Us came out and he tried the accessibility features. This is what we've been with myself and, and other access, like people in the accessibility community. This is what we've been advocating for for so long. There's so much here. This is why I do what I do. <laughs> this is why I work so hard to promote accessibility. This is, this is why, because this is important. I think it's right. This is really important. Um, as you can see, it really makes a difference in life. And when you have that power, that power, you know, to make a difference in, in someone's life, uh, you know, it's kind of a duty to do it. So, you know, because games are for everyone and that's very important. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's why accessibility, you know, helps a lot of people. I just wanted to share that with you today. And on that note, uh, we're going to talk about making, uh, you know, our screen accessible. Um, so first task for you, um, we got feedback from our wireframe that we did uh, for the Fortnite uh, mode selection screen. Uh, and the following issues have been reported to us. So the text says how to read on smaller screen and for players with visual disabilities like Steve. Uh, the designer also want to add a narrator voice when you hover on each mode. Uh, but people with hearing disabilities or people who need to keep the sound down. So like I said, siblings are like uh, baby sleeping, for example, uh, won't be able to experience the narration. So in the Miro board, you're gonna see the fourth, uh, sorry about that. The fourth board that says making game accessible. Uh, and I want you to write some ideas uh, about how we could improve the experience for these players. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes for this. Uh, probably like maybe uh, four, something like this. And so, yeah, you can use post it, uh, write down some ideas you have. So, the text is hard to read. We want to find a solution for this. Uh, it can be an option. It can be changing our wireframe a little bit uh, or both, you know, sometimes we do both. Uh, and, you know, that with that new feature that the designer want to implement, uh, we also need to find solutions before they actually implement it to make sure that screen is uh, accessible to the most people. Okay, what did you guys write? A mode for photosensitive people. That's interesting. Um, for photosensitive people, actually, what we do is uh, this test for the games uh, before they're released, uh, especially for Xbox and PlayStation. Um, we, we do those tests like Xbox and PlayStation. This is mandatory test to make sure uh, that it passed the, the photosensitive test, yeah, um, for people who have uh, seizures and things like this. Um, and we have to put warnings as well at the beginning of games. Language selection of subtitles, bigger, bolder letters. As they over on the mode, the text can be magnified. That's really interesting. Subtitles transcript might help. More contrast to be added. Animated sign language, that's really cool. I wish I could see it. 
uh, in a game. Uh, it's also good to know that not not every uh, deaf uh, uh, person who identifies as deaf uh, actually use sign language. So it's nice to offer an alternative as well for that. Um, highly modif modified subtitles, yes. Do you have an example of what you mean by uh, Harley mode Modi? I can't pronounce that word, so I'll just do it. Different color option, dark mode and higher contrast. That's really nice too. Uh, pop up boxes for text when you over them. Yes, add option for subtitles. It's really good. We got a lot of ideas there. I prefer focus on each set of selectable tab when you over over it. So the tab takes over the whole screen. It's a good idea. I like that. More contrast can be added to the screen. Text size can be increased in which text is unreadable. The text can be narrated. The narration can have subtitles and optional features for people who may have auditory disabilities. That's great too. I love this. Yes. That's lovely. You guys got plenty of ideas. Many things I didn't think about. It's great. Narration can announce the name of the mode. The narration subtitles can be in the box where the name of the game mode is shown. Can I like a subtitles before people can't listen to it? Can just read it. Can I like a text message here? Yes, it's nice. That's really good. Well, you guys were done. A lot of ideas. A lot of them are very, very interesting, actually. Um, here's here's a couple of you know uh, suggestions I have. Uh, for sure, adding an option to increase the size of the text. Uh, a player should be able to just double their text. It's actually a, a guidelines from the Xbox uh, community. Um, it's something we have to give as an option. Uh, but you know, fixing that text in the first place might also be a good idea. Just making sure our design has big enough text so uh, anyone can read them. Um, increase the increasing the contrast also can really you know help a lot. Uh, making sure that text is even more readable. Uh, there's a brand right now that's like black or dark gray on black screen. I don't know if you saw that a couple of times. It's horrible. Nothing can be read. Uh, hope it never makes it to video games. Um, and also, you know, adding subtitles to support the narration of each mode, I think it's really cool. Uh, even better, better, I think, would be to include a written version of the narration uh, next to the game mode's title, for example. Uh, I think it could really help, uh, you know, not having to, like, if you miss it, for example, you can just reread it uh, instead of, uh, you know, being able to, you have you would have to restart the game to listen to it again, which is ridiculous. That's really cool. You guys have a lot of great ideas. I'm gonna keep reading this. The dark mode I really like. Uh, different font options and sizes, exactly. That's what we should be doing. That's awesome. So we got all of this feedback because we did something very important in the first place. And uh, that very important thing is playtesting. Um, it's very important for it, for UX designers to playtest, and it's something that falls on onto your task. Um, playtests are, you know, organized video game sessions uh, where the designers can get opinions from player about the game. Um, there's different types of playtests. Uh, there's a something we call the focus playtest. Uh, when we want to focus a feature, uh, for example, like the combat in the game, the crafting, etc. A level as well can be something we play test. So we want to try out, you know, the intro, making sure it works. Um, and accessibility can also be play testing. Uh, we get, you know, player uh, with disabilities to come in and give us their opinion on on the features. Uh, there's also something called A/B testing. Uh, where we give 50% of the player one option. For example, uh, that weapon is blue, and the other 50 player uh, another option. For example, that weapon is red, and we kind of compare the results and see uh, kind of like which one people prefer, uh, which one works the best 
uh, kind of. Um, and then, you know, this larger size uh, play test uh, to test out, you know, the flow uh, and the game progression as well. Um, and what's fun about it is that, you know, anyone can do it. Anyone can play test. Uh, you can be young, you can be old, you can be an expert gamer or player who have never touched a game before. Uh, you can play test. Um, we don't judge the play tester. Uh, after three people not understanding a feature, you know, out of five, we usually, it usually means there's a problem. Um, so what's important for us is really gathering data about dislike and like, uh, comments about how a feature works, uh, what they feel doesn't make it work, uh, we're looking for reactions. So um, we usually ask people to speak out loud, which is a very weird exercise for people to do, about you know what they, they're thinking of doing. So it would happen in like one of those rooms, for example, that's a larger playtest thing. Um, that's Ubisoft, I think, definitely Ubisoft. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, we set them up in this kind of room. Um, we put them, you know, they each have their work, their their own, you know, station when they can play the game. Uh, we are filming and watching them, which is a bit creepy. Said like this, but it works. Uh, and then sometimes we ask them, you know, a specific question like, "Oh, you did this. Uh, what did you think? What did you expect the game to be doing after you did this?" Or I saw you had an issue on that task. Uh, can you ex can you walk me through it? Things like this. Like, what did you think the game was going to do? Um, and then you know they'll give us answers like, I don't know. Or, like, I was doing this thing. I thought the game was going to do that, but at the end it did this. I don't understand. It makes no sense. Change the game. Uh, things like that. That's what we're looking for. Um, so yeah, let's let's. That's our final task. It's probably the funniest of all. Uh, let's play test. Um, so let's put our knowledge into action. So uh, we asked you to pick your favorite game. If you don't have it, that's fine. Uh, if you want to choose a game just like that, it's cool too. Uh, I'm going to be playing Fortnite on my side, maybe commenting on it. Uh, so they just released an update uh, that looks just like, just like Among Us. I want to see what it looks like. Um, and you know, from, from the observation that you made uh, uh, while you're playing that game, um, Try and think of ways we could improve the user experience. How can it be enhanced? So, uh, is the text, you know, the text difficult to read? Uh, uh, or, you know, it's placed in a way that's a bit odd. Uh, can you easily navigate the menus? Can you use a feature without any problem? Um, maybe write at least, you know, one one pain point you encounter during the play test. Um, and you know, be be mindful of when you're feeling frustrated because that's usually where it's like an area of the game that needs improving. Um, okay, so I'll let you guys do that. We're probably gonna take like a bit more time. I would say eight minutes because we're a bit uh, over time right now. Oh, sorry. Okay, and I'm gonna share my screen with Fortnite. Just need to launch it for us. I wonder what the new uh, game mode looks like. We'll check it out. I don't usually play Fortnite, but I started for you guys. <laughs> no, I think I like it too much. <laughs> that just always dies in the first minute of the game. It's kind of sad. You never get to weapons. Just going to quickly interrupt. Um, if if you don't have a game near you and are able to access the game to be able to play test, what you can do is um, we'll be doing a bit of a Q and A with Clara uh, after once we've done sort of the practical workshop. So you can think of any questions and pop them in a the chat, and we'll be able to uh, ask those questions to Clara and she'll be able to answer. Um, so yeah, just a reminder that. Feel free to pop any questions you have in the chat and we'll be able to do a bit of a Q&A later. I see a good one in the chat already. If we have a lot of accessibility options, it might get overwhelming to know how to manipulate the loads of options you might get in a game like Last of Us 2. That's an excellent point. <laughs> That's one of the issues we have right now, <laughs> is that we get games with more and more and more options, but there's no way to really 
they haven't they haven't organized it yet they like mostly put it in one screen uh and you know just deal with it um what the last of us 2 does and they do it really well um is that you have presets so when you enter the game for the first time uh it'll ask you uh if you want a preset for uh for i think four different types of disability group kind of um so you got the visual the hearing uh motor uh no i think free free they didn't do the they didn't do the psychological one um yeah and then so in those options there's already options like that are pre-selected for you they can tell you like okay you might be someone with uh hearing disorder like hearing disability so um obviously we put on the subtitles for you you we make them so they're like super readable um and then we add like um how do you call this the sound design like with the descriptions of, of of sound that happens around you uh last of us also have an arrow that shows direction for those and so they kind of made the presets to simplify uh you know turning off and on those options uh but all in all in the in, you know the accessibility community actually um uh, those people like going through options because they like to make something that works for them and you know adapting it to their needs um so the best, you know, like we shouldn't stop ourselves from doing many, many options just because it might be a bit overwhelming because there's, you know, there's always something for everyone in there um, and everyone needs different, different accessibility options, you know. That was a really good question. All right, so what does this battle royale look like? Oh, what are you guys playing? I'm interested, actually. Can you tell me in the chat what games you are We've run things successfully uh, for playing, uh, playtesting at the moment? We, the imagined order, facing crisis after crisis without a single failure. But since Jones betrayed us, Stanley Parable. Oh, I love this game. <laughs> Mario Kart, that's, that's really good. I mean, there's always something to improve. Clash Royale. Forza, nice, nice. Genshin Impact. I, don't, I didn't play this one yet. I feel like I should. It looks amazing. FIFA, yes. Classic. Oh, imposter. Ooh, let me try that. CSGO, what is this? Hollow Knight, great game. Counter Strike, oh, all right. <laughs> Never played it. I'm not too much into uh, into shooter games, but I heard it's great. All right, okay, let's try that. Imposter, wonder what it looks like. Minecraft, Atomy Crops. I don't know this one. What is it about? Ugh, oh, I need to squat. Minecraft. I hesitated between, you know, um, between uh, Fortnite and Minecraft to present. Oh, I'm just allergic to the UI in Minecraft. It's really hard to read. I have a question for you, Clara. Actually. Yeah, tell me. What, what, what's your personal thoughts on the Fortnite kind of user journey so you just you're, you're loading into a solo game now but yeah do you think there could be any improvements from going to the title splash screen to where you're in the game right now i don't think so to be honest um that makes sense for me to like like i went through the lobby and then from the lobby i can select everything that's kind of like the main hub and then they, they get you to this main hub uh, and then you always come back to it. Uh, All right. Where should I go? I don't know. I'm never finding weapons in this game anyway. So, 
What, what are you when you play testing? What's your kind of fir your first thoughts when you're sort of jumping into a game, like particularly um, play tester? Um, like I like to, I like to get like my first impression is usually the best impression. Uh, usually I get I just like it's like I, I just. Yeah, after after two minutes of playing, you're like, okay, I see what's the problem here. Uh, it's usually pretty clear. Uh, for more like detailed features that have been worked on a long a longer time, uh, to be honest, it comes down to like um, testing it with new people um, because at some point I just like I, I don't see anything uh, in the game anymore. Like to me, it works, and most of the time it doesn't. Um, so yeah, it's kind of yeah, um, yeah. It's like um, I don't really know. We have like we have some uh, <laughs> we have some stuff we're looking for when we play testing. Uh, sign and think back is one of them. I think I talked about this a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, if they're not here, it's kind of like the first thing we're looking for most of the time, and then it's. Yeah, it's like uh, wherever we get in playtesting, Julie is right. Okay. I right, unfortunately I cannot play this any longer because we're well, gonna be late. Otherwise, sorry, I didn't shoot people. All right. So yeah, it's over. Um, I hope you, I hope you liked it. Um, I surely have like a lot of fun doing this. It's the first time I do it for UX design. Um, it's definitely really, it was really fun for me. Um, so if you have to, to remember anything, um, today, uh, user experience is really the process of supporting user behavior. So for usability, usefulness and desirability, uh, provided, you know, in, in the interaction uh, with a product, so in this case, a video game. Um, it isn't all about how visually pleasing the game is. Like I said, a, the, those things are two different stuff. Um, it's really about how functional and easy to use it is. Um, the best games, you know, they tell a great story, they showcase beautiful art, uh, they feel good to play, and they're accessible to all. And you know, games, games are awesome. So everyone should be able to play them and everyone should be able to make them. And uh, you know, if you have an idea one day, just give it a try. It's it's amazing. Um, so yeah, I'll be answering uh, questions. Um, I can also give clarification about stuff we discussed. Um, I put a couple of resources in the worksheet that you received. Um, just two ones I wanted to repeat is the Game UX Summit. Uh, which has a lot of uh, uh, talks uh, from uh, from you know uh, UX designers um, about uh, UX topics that are really interesting. They tackle a lot of different things, um, uh, and there's also the server uh, we can fix it in UI uh, that has a, a notion. It's it's a it's kind of a, like a software when you can uh, some type of wiki basically. Um, and it has a lot of information about making it into the industry, uh, how to do a portfolio, uh, how to uh, deal with interview and things like this. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'll take your questions. Thank you so much, Clara. Um, and just before, I mean, keep, keep sending the questions in. Um, I've just got a few things to go through before we dive into the kind of Q&A uh, before we really wrap things up. Um, so I just want to first remind uh, everybody that we're, the summer school workshops are still going on. We've still got a few lined up um, and we have some uh, that you can still access uh, through recordings of the past sessions. Um, so we've got a, a load of summer school workshops that cover a wide range um, of different practices from designing visually distinct zines, which are like little mini magazines. Uh, to looking at film production skills uh, with filmmaker Georgia Hardcastle. Um, and we've even got a slightly similar workshop in the sense that uh, there's going to be a workshop with UX consultant uh, Amy Shaw, 
And that's really good for those who are looking to build their portfolio, uh, be it for college or university or for professional use. And all of our workshops are designed to give you an insight into lots of different areas that your creativity could take you and suggest that like different jobs that you can go into. I certainly, when I was younger, I didn't think, you know, being a UX designer for video games in particular was a thing that you can do. Um, and so if you haven't already, you can book your place uh, onto the website and we'll send a link, which Annabelle will drop into the chat for you now. Um, we're also offering the opportunity to receive an official NUA certificate, uh, which is great to put in for those who are looking at doing the UCAS personal statements uh, for university or any other higher education qualification. So, to get a hold of one of these certificates, you need to attend six of the 12 summer school workshops, and we want to see outcomes from at least three of those workshops. So for today, um, you can use the wireframes that you've been building. So if you go onto the Mara boards and either take a screenshot of the wireframe that you've been building, or if you kind of take a note of it and you can either sketch it up in your own time, uh, or use some other software to make a wireframe, uh, your uh, most selection screen that you've been working on today. Uh, you can easily submit that and it'd be great to see the work that you've been doing and the wireframe that you've been making. Um, so you can send uh, your three outcomes to us by email, uh, which is student.recruitment at anyway.ac.uk. And again, Annabelle will pop that email into the chat for you. Uh, but please note that any work that you submit may be used to promote future events. Um, we, and it also, like I said, we want to see your work. So email them to us, uh, but also you can tag us with our Instagram, which is at anyway outreach. And we can share that on Instagram. And we'll be sharing a lot of our favorite pieces. We've already had loads of amazing work uh, and particular favorites of mine have been when we were chatting with animator Dan Kelby and lots of great responses to that. Um, so we'd love to see your work uh, that you've been doing today. Um, and again, Annabelle will put the Instagram handle into the chat for you there. And finally, each um, over the course of the summer school workshops, we're giving away a chili bottle and we've got some amazing anyway chili bottles. Um, so to be in the chance of winning one of those, uh, if you don't mind filling in a feedback form, um, which we'll be sending to you by email uh, at the end of each week of the summer school. So if you fill in a feedback form, you'll be with a chance of winning a really snazzy chili bottle. Um, so that's all of my spiel there. I believe we've had quite a few questions coming in. So I'm going to fire away. We've already uh, answered that really great one about accessibility options. Um, so I know I just want to start off with, what's the perfect game that you've played, Farah? I don't know if there's a perfect game uh, per se. <laughs> I don't think it exists yet. And like I said, I really love The Last of Us, I think. Uh, it was an impressive experience. It made me feel things, which is enough to make it a perfect game to me. Uh, I also loved, uh, I think Inside Inside was pretty much perfect game for me. Yeah, I had like the right amount of fun, a puzzle, which I love, and, and emotions that, you know, make, made it really, really impactful for like a four hour game. <laughs> that was really good, yeah. And that ending to Inside. I'm oh, I know. I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of Inside. Uh, so for those old enough, check out Inside. It's a great experience. Um, how is how is the UX designer career options? So I suppose they're asking, um, what are the different career options for being a UX designer or how to get in, I suppose? How to get in, mostly? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, so yeah, if, if, if you talk about um, what are the career options like to becoming a UX designer? Okay, becoming a UX designer. Ah, um, there's starting to be a couple of uh, degrees you can get from university, uh, mostly uh, HCI, which stands for Human Computer Interaction. 
uh, there's also UX design uh, masters you can get. Uh, obviously, I haven't gone through those. <laughs> I studied cinema. Um, most UX designers start off a UI designer. Uh, most of the time, that's what we do first. We go through interfaces and then we grow into UX uh, later on in our career. So that's also a good way if you like interface in the first place. Um, game designers also sometimes become UX designers. UX designers also sometimes become game designers. Um, but you know, like the, the video game industry is pretty wild for that. Like you get people who have uh, like no, like they didn't do any education in that field specifically, and and you know they kind of get to this role uh, because at the end it's about how you know you develop yourself professionally, uh, not so much what you learn in school. Um, so then there's many ways, <laughs> but if you're looking for a diploma, which which might be I guess easier to get in in the industry nowadays, uh, there's there's specialists who who, are, who have UX design. Uh, in their uh, as classes, and I know there's masters about it. Uh, there's nothing specific for video game. Um, it's uh, mostly for website uh, products, things like this. Brilliant. And how do we go around accessibility issues surrounding people having anxiety issues, or maybe having difficulty reading social signals, or having difficulty with understanding references? References. Okay. Hmm. It's a very good question. Again, Asha, I'll see you. You ask good questions. Um, anxiety issues. There's, there's, at the end, you know, the, the player chooses what they're going to play. Um, so, warning might be the only way <laughs> to tell people with anxiety this might not be a game that you like. Uh, recently, uh, there's a game that just came out last week, uh, Boyfriend Dungeon. At the beginning of the game, they let you know that there's a character named Mom that's going to send you a couple of messages during the game. And uh, you can choose to turn them off if you don't want to, because that's a trigger for a lot of people. Um, and you know, th this is those kind of options. You know, every game is different, so it's hard to tell, like, uh, specifically, uh, you know, what type of, you know, what can trigger anxiety in which game. Uh, difficulty reading social signals. Well, the thing about game is that they have to be, you know, they're not, uh, most of them are pretty straightforward. Uh, like, no, I don't want to say that actually. This is, this is not how I should say it. Um, this is a good, this is a really good question actually. Uh, reading social signals is a good one. Um, but there's probably something to be doing there. It depends if it's, you know, if it's part of the experience of the game as well. Um, because if you need to be reading social cues to be playing that game, there should probably be something there uh, for the type of the people, you know, have difficulties with this. Um, yeah, that would be my answer. It's not great uh, because it's still something, still some topics that we are thinking about. Um, and you know, we only start to implement them into our games. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's really interesting questions because a lot of it is coming unfolding as it's going on. Yeah, putting down the train tracks as the train's going. Um, but we've just had more questions come through. What do? You... Oh, I think. Hold on. I think that's a question for us actually. Um, a thing about submitting uh, for the NUA certificate. So with the wireframes uh, that you've been making uh, as part of task, I think it was number two, um, where you're building wireframes for the Fortnite most selection screen. If you take a screenshot of that from the Myra board of the wireframe that you've been making, or you can sketch it out uh, in your own time, or you can make it really fancy in Photoshop, some other software, and send that over to us via our email, uh, studentrecruitment at nua.ac.uk. Uh, that will count as one of your submissions there. Um, and yes, just to quickly add on to that, you can watch previous workshops and submit uh, 
a submit a response from there and that will all be explained in those videos. Um, just seeing if we have any more questions. Um, I see Asha answered uh, with an example. Um, anxiety issues when navigating an open world. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think that's that's really common. Uh, not knowing what to do, not knowing where to go. Um, it's a big question for open worlds. It's not just an accessibility issues. It's just uh, a design questions for a lot of them. Uh, you know where to send people, uh, how to make people understand which zones they, uh, you know, have the level for, if it's something they do. Um, you know, there's there's actually options on this, uh, like waypoints, um, uh, not secure. Um, what's the last? I don't I don't remember the name. Uh, not secure. What's the the other uh, Japanese game that came out not so long ago? Um, well, I don't remember. Uh, but yeah, there was like a waypoint that was done for this game, a waypoint system that was not uh, that was not in the first place in the game. They added it as an accessibility option because a lot of people couldn't find their way through the world, and that was true for you know not only people with anxieties vis-à-vis uh, -vis the the you know the 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 Oh my God, I'm losing all my words. The the open world uh, game, but also actually people with visual disabilities who use waypoints to orient themselves in an open world setting. Um, so they added those waypoints afterwards. Uh, otherwise, they used uh, wind just for people to find their way through the world. Right. Um, just to answer questions about recordings, for this session, you should receive uh, an email uh, to the recording of this session when that gets uh, eventually loaded up uh, onto YouTube. Um, but if you want to access the, the previous workshops, for now, if you just send an email to studentrecruitment at nua.ac.uk um, and just ask uh, for uh, access to the recordings of the previous sessions and they should be able to help you out from there. Uh, we have another question for you, Clara. Um, and I totally relate to this one, actually. What do you think about times and levels? I keep looking at the timer and waste time thinking if I'll finish it. And I totally relate to that anxiety of, oh no, I've got 30 seconds to run through this level. Ah. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a design choice. Um, you know, sometimes it's a good reason for having a timer because it needs to be precise. Uh, you know, it needs to instill like some kind of excitement on the game. Yes, they're really difficult moments, but hopefully they're not always like the whole game is not based on that, basically. Um, Ori and the Blind Forest did it really well. It doesn't use a timer, but you know, as the level of the the water is, for, is going on, it's kind of a timer. The level of water is like, uh, getting bigger and bigger and you have to escape that that level uh, that's another kind of timer that's actually feel better because you're not playing against a number which is annoying uh, that's what we tend to avoid in games in general uh, you know playing with yeah playing with your stamina for example who is a number having a timer on the side that's really people keep looking at it instead of playing the game uh, it's not the best UX you can have in a game um, know what I think about it. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> Again, if it's like one level in the middle of a game that's like fifteen hours long, I don't. I, I don't care. If the if the game is made like this, then you know maybe it's not a great game uh, for you to be playing if you don't like this type. Brilliant. Um, so don't have any more questions. If you do have any more final, final, final questions, because we need to wrap up. Do pop him in the chat now. Um, oh, just had another one just come through. Whose responsibility should it be to teach basic gaming concepts? Like very basic stuff, which many UX designers take for granted. Being from somewhere who never got my hands on a proper AAA game before, um, it was really hard to make 
Sorry, I've lost where I'm reading. It was really hard to make heads or tails of anything. I was doing, uh, sorry, making heads or tails of anything I was doing, which kind of made me give up approaching those kinds of games. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, first of all, we, we don't take those for granted. Um, this is our job. Uh, so we do teach, we do need to teach basic gaming concept. Now, I think I understand what you mean. Uh, it's the kind of those things that you need to know if you've been in game before, like if you if you played games since you were young, it's kind of like the sprint in Super Mario. Uh, nobody ever explained it to you, like it's not written anywhere. Uh, you need someone did explain it to you and say, oh, you can sprint on Super Mario. And sometimes that's how you learn stuff. Um, and then, you know, you, you integrate them and then uh, when you play another game, you're like, I could probably sprint if I'm pressing this button. Uh, I think that's what you're talking about. Um, technically, yes, it's the UX designer's job to explain everything. Um, we, we try to be as far as possible, you know, even for moving, jumping. Uh, some games don't explain it, but, you know, sometimes you need it. Uh, yeah, um, but yes, it's not something we take for granted. This is part of, of, of our job to do it. Um, definitely, we are the one teaching, like like uh, working with rebel teams to uh, implement onboarding is how we call it. Um, so that means um, teaching the player how to uh, to play the game and use the features in the game. I hope I answer your question. Thank you so much, Clara. Um, Probably going to wrap it up there. Apologies for running a little bit over time, but it seems most of you have stayed. So thank you very much uh, for joining us today. And thank you, Clara, so much for your time, uh, for a really fun workshop and for your insight um, into, you know, not just UX and games, but it seems to be a lot of really good conversation about accessibility as well, which is always great. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your interest. Uh, if you have questions, I, I, I let my email address for you guys. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions if you have other questions about career, for example, stuff like this. And, and of course, adding on to that, you can always, uh, I'm always dropping in that email, the student recruitment at anyway.ac.uk email. You can, if you do have further questions for Clara, uh, you know, you can always use that email address as well. Um, and there is a lot of love, well, a lot of thank you in the chat. How do you pronounce your last name? It's Pujar. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin can't pronounce my last name, it's okay. <laughs> I've known you for eight years and I still can't pronounce your name. Right. But again, thank you everyone for joining. And Clara, thank you so much. My pleasure. Have a good day, everyone. Take care, everybody.